appreciate the opportunity to spend some time with you all this morning and appreciate everyone coming to learn more about living with melanoma. Um, so my talk is on skin cancer screening. I have no conflicts of interest. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I approach taking care of my patients, but then also to talk about how we're working to bring early melanoma detection to under-resourced areas. When we talk about melanoma, we talk about primary prevention and secondary prevention. Primary prevention is taking steps to reduce your risk of making a melanoma in the first place. And that really involves sun safe practices. Secondary prevention is the concept that melanoma is going to happen, but how can we shift the curve to diagnose it at earlier stages where patients can be treated with straightforward therapeutic excisions and they don't need neoadjuvant therapy or more aggressive systemic therapy. Um, that's also the concept of raising awareness among patients and family members who may be at risk and the concept of developing risk stratification to better define who should receive skin cancer screening examinations. Where I come into play is when I see my patients in our multidisciplinary melanoma clinic, I'm also, as a dermatologist, helping to detect any potential local recurrence within the scar, within regional lymph nodes. I'm also very carefully examining my patients to determine if they've made a second primary cutaneous melanoma elsewhere on their skin. And for a lot of our patients, diagnosing non-melanoma skin cancers, which certainly aren't a, as great a risk to survival as melanoma, but are still very important to detect early from a quality of life standpoint. The tools that I use in my practice include dermoscopy. A dermatoscope is a fairly low-tech device that's a 10X magnifier paired with polarized light or regular light illumination. But if you're good at interpreting the images, it can significantly improve your accuracy for detecting melanoma, but also help you remove fewer benign moles to find one melanoma. So on the right is an example of a patient who had this area on the back of his arm, didn't know it was there. Uh, but this is the picture that we see with dermoscopy where we see so much more information about the tumor. And as a dermatologist who has expertise in interpreting this image, I know automatically that this is an early melanoma that needs to be removed in a very specific manner. This is another example of a patient who had an amelanotic melanoma. You can see that this pinky brown area on the patient's back is not what we consider to be the poster child picture of melanoma. It certainly doesn't have multiple colors. It's not grossly irregular in its borders, but using dermoscopy to examine this tumor, I know automatically that it's a melanoma and that it needs to be removed completely for diagnostic purposes. The other tool that I have in my toolbox is total body photography. Total body photography really exploits the concept that normal moles don't change and melanomas do. Now that's with the caveat that it's completely normal to make new moles and for your existing moles to continue to grow and develop till you're about in your early to mid 40s. This is an example of a publication that shows the baseline photography and then the interval change detected with comparison of the patient to those photographs, showing that there are small tumors that look fairly innocuous that can be early melanomas, where total body photography gives you the opportunity to diagnose those at very early stages. This is an example from one of my patients where she's very fair complected, so she tends to make moles that are more pink in their coloration. And this was her baseline photography on the left, and on the right, you can see that this tumor demonstrated interval growth. And when I looked with dermoscopy, you can see that there are little pink dots and there's a little bit of pigmentation around the periphery. Given the interval change, I was concerned that this may be an early melanoma and it was a Breslow depth 0.6 millimeters. So the combination of dermoscopy and total body photography really helps to support my diagnostic accuracy for melanoma. So this is sort of the, the typical, what I call a gold star patient for my practice, where they're really in the right place if they're coming to see me because they have hundreds of moles and those moles have a broad variety of appearance. So when I'm taking care of these patients, I'm really looking them over to determine what's their ugly duckling. What are the outliers from their typical atypical nevi? And when I'm looking at the patient, I'm using both my clinical examination and dermoscopy to help me sort what's okay and what's not. 
Um, total body photography is enormously helpful with these patients. And when I have the luxury of having total body photography, I'm comparing basically mole to mole from the patient to the photograph to determine what's changed and what hasn't. Anything that's changing, I'm examining very carefully with dermoscopy to determine if it's a, an expected change for my younger patients or whether there are features that are concerning for melanoma. Once I go through those two steps of analyses, then I'm typically left with maybe two or three lesions that really need further examination. For every tumor that I remove in my practice, I take clinical and dermoscopic photographs and I'm very specific with the words that I use to communicate to my pathologist. If I think it's an early melanoma, that's exactly what I say. If I think it's a junctional nevus that has moderately dysplastic features, that's what I say. And that helps me continue to refine my accuracy because when I get that report back, I'm looking to see how close I was to the pathologist and then I'm reviewing my pictures so that I can continue to learn if I get something not quite right. When I take things off my patients, I take it off completely with a two millimeter clinical margin and I close the hole that I make with sutures. A lot of my patients come from out of state. And while this takes more time, it does help me mitigate the risk of having a nevus that has some atypical features, but with a positive margin where we then and need to go back and do an additional therapeutic excision. Um, that's a luxury that I have, being in an academic practice at a major medical center. Um, but that's typically how I take care of my patients. I wanna spend a moment talking about anxiety with our patients who are diagnosed with melanoma. The typical recipe for patients who come to me in tears is a patient who is a young mother who had to advocate to have their melanoma biopsied, who then feel that because they were the only one who could tell that that spot was of concern, that it's their responsibility to diagnose the rest of their skin issues. And that can sometimes evolve into patients being really truly obsessed in an unhealthy way with their skin. And the way that usually manifests is that patients are performing full skin examinations multiple times a day. They're losing sleep, worried that they're going to lose their lives to melanoma because they can't find their melanoma again. And in those circumstances, when I meet those patients in my clinic, I ask permission to share something that I've observed about them. And I say, you know, I'm sensing a lot of worry about yourself. Can I share what I've seen with other patients who have gone through a similar journey to yours? And in that circumstance, those total body photographs and doing that mole to mole comparison really become a lifeline to better mental health. I will say that for some patients, we have a talk about helping to establish care with a, with a psychologist or a psychiatrist if I feel that we're really tipping over into having a lot of distress that I can't help manage. But for the vast majority of patients, that process of seeing them as frequently as they need for their peace of mind, which can sometimes be every six to eight weeks, really goes a long way to developing trust and at some point, the patient says, you know what, Dr. Nelson, I really think I'm okay to go eight weeks this time, or I'm okay to go three months this time. And eventually, as we gain that trust, they're able to graduate their care at their, at their rate of comfort. So just to, just to bring that up, I think it's something that's really under-discussed in the care of our melanoma patients. So I've talked about how I practice. <laughs> I want to talk for a few minutes about how we're supporting bringing melanoma diagnosis to underserved areas. Um, I have the enormous privilege of receiving support through our MD Anderson Melanoma Moonshot to help support what I'm going to talk about next because it's challenging to obtain funding for melanoma prevention efforts. Um, we have developed over the past four years a, a outreach to all the academic dermatology programs in Texas to teach dermoscopy. Um, we're in the process of converting that to online learning modules. And last year, we actually expanded to a few additional centers beyond Texas to really teach how to interpret those dermoscopic images. But what's true about this and what's true about patients who come to my practice is that by and large, their melanoma mortality threshold has already been set. 
Certainly the, the help of our surgical and medical oncologist helps to reduce that risk. But as their dermatologist, I can't do a whole lot to change their survival threshold. I can only do that by educational outreach to other doctors who have access to other patients who don't have the same opportunities for early diagnosis. So just to share the big picture of what we're trying to accomplish through this is that we've, we've built a scalable dermoscopy education program for the state of Texas to teach dermoscopy. We are using Project ECHO, which is a concept of telementoring to teach other physicians and other advanced practice providers a new diagnostic skill. We've paired that with an easy to use image repository for dermoscopic images of tumors that are of concern so that we can discuss those in our case conferences through the Project ECHO system. We're working with the Texas Cancer Registry to define where in melanoma are patients being diagnosed with high-stage melanomas, and what do those patients look like from a demographic standpoint? We have a very diverse cohort of patients in Texas, and the typical answer for who should be screened for melanoma are Caucasian gentlemen over the age of 60 to 65. Caucasian people are in the minority for the state of Texas, and so we need to make sure that we really understand who our target outreach population should be to help shift that curve to an earlier point of diagnosis for Texas. And then finally, to, oops, excuse me, let me click back here. Um, and then finally, to help support um, patients in identifying melanoma on their own skin or to help family members look at their loved one's skin so that patients can participate in the advocacy of having their skin examined because with the primary care outreach, we're still only reaching patients who have primary care providers. And there are areas of our state where there's really challenging access to not only primary care providers, but there are no dermatologists to see patients. Uh, and this map just gives you a really quick uh, glance at how enormous the state of Texas is from a geography standpoint. And so we're optimistic that this process of helping to triage who we should target the specific areas of the state for outreach, and then helping to teach our primary care colleagues that the combination of those efforts can help shift the diagnosis curve for melanoma to earlier stages for our state. So just to summarize here, we've talked about how I approach early diagnosis and monitoring for second primary tumors among my patient cohort, and that includes the use of dermoscopy, the use of total body photography, and also being attuned to the mental health of my patients. In areas that are underserved, we are, we have already engaged with educational outreach to primary care providers, and we're working with the Texas Cancer Registry to better understand where and for whom to target our continued outreach efforts. And this is certainly a team effort on one person, but there's an enormous team behind the efforts that we're undertaking to try to shift that diagnosis curve for the state of Texas.